If you weren't keeping up, over the anniversary of the game this week, the devs announced a ton of stuff, including a proper trailer for the upcoming expansion and name, End of Dragons. I talked about that yesterday. But also, some other goodies, including that the game is coming to Steam and a mini preview at the new Fractal, including where it's located. So today, I want to talk about those two things and what exactly they might mean for the game, because generally speaking, I think they're both really positive, awesome moves. Let's start off with Guild Wars 2 being confirmed to come to Steam. Now, that's happening this November. It's been eight years with Guild Wars 2 as a standalone game that was not giving a cut to Valve. And now here we are, they are moving over. It seems that in general, most people in the community are really excited about the mood, think that it's going to be a big population boost. And honestly, after some cursory googling this morning, it seems like it's very likely to be true. Previously established big games that eventually move to Steam do nearly always get something of a renewed population just by moving to that platform and lots of people start seeing it. And I don't think it's just going to be new players that will be caught by this, but there's probably a lot of old players that have since put the game down uninstalled, and because they don't every day end up finding themselves on the official Guild Wars 2 website, they don't find that temptation to reinstall. But they do find themselves most days on Steam, and in which case they're probably going to be enticed to move on over. So I think it's going to be good. You can look at very recently this year when EA moved back to Steam and decided to stop with their whole origin exclusivity thing. You know, they can't compete with Steam and the Epic Games Store and so on. So all their games moved back over to Steam. If you look at the best sellers of July, like of the top 20 games, 8 of them are EA games that were on Origin. And so that means all those games will have had a surge of people playing them and enjoying them. I know there's a little bit of a thing where quite often people buy stuff for their Steam library, but they don't actually necessarily touch it. But it's not just that. It does seem to translate into actual real player activity. Of particular interest among those games that were on Origin have moved over, uh, you can look at Star Wars The Old Republic, which is an MMO. And so this is a really good case study, I think. Whenever I think of Star Wars The Old Republic, which is a game I've never played, to be clear, I always think it's very much a kindred spirit to Guild Wars 2. And the reason for that is, back before this game came out, many of us on the fan sites and forums excited about Guild Wars 2 were looking at other games coming out at the time. I remember Ion was a particular one that ended up releasing quite early while we were following Guild Wars 2 news. And then there was Star Wars 2. They were kind of in development in tandem, and obviously Star Wars ended up coming out, what was it, a year? Maybe slightly more before Guild Wars 2? But I remember there was always a lot of crossover back then. They feel like MMOs released from the same era, and well, so they just went to Steam and had a huge boost. Supposedly, it's actually a good time to go back and get into that game just because of all of that added excitement, which is obviously so important for an MMO's health and success. Uh, the actual numbers they had was 27,400 peak players connecting through Steam, that is, and an average of 18,400 people newly in that MMO connecting specifically through Steam. And that was just last month, by the way. So that's not too shoddy, and I wouldn't be upset at all to see that for Guild Wars. I know that there's some fear that a lot of new players would equal lag and so on. And yes, Guild Wars has gone through periods where you can definitely feel it gets laggier. Most recently was the Path of Fire launch. I do remember certain elements of the game started acting a bit fiddly, and you could kind of tell it's because the population had gone up massively. But hopefully ArenaNet can anticipate that, it could be flexible about that. And look, you're never going to hear me argue that the game shouldn't have a population boost just because of some interim lag issues. More players is obviously going to be better. So population stats are really interesting, I think, as well. I don't know this. Maybe you guys can help me out in the comments. I don't know if developers can choose to hide them or not, but it's interesting because Guild Wars 2 as an MMO has tended to hide its population stats. And the reason for that is if they do get low at certain points and you're publishing them, that can create kind of a self-fulfilling issue where players see a low population, so they stop playing, so the low population persists and so on. ArenaNet have always been a little bit uh, veiled about that, and I think probably rightly so. The closest we usually get is at an event like this anniversary where they might release a big infographic saying, you know, X players did this, Y players did this, and you'll get somewhat close. 
But if it's coming to Steam, and if Steam forces you to reveal who's connecting through it, uh, then that will be uh, one of the first signs that, in a very blatant, open, obvious way, we can see player population. And people will even be able to compare that to other competing games, and, you know, maybe that will affect reviews and stuff. I'm not sure whether it's really the sign of a healthy game if we in the community are obsessed over stuff like that, but it is of some curious note to me. Even if there is a little bit of risk there, maybe, maybe reviews, for example, don't do too well because Living World has all these paywalls. Players might get into the game, find these paywalls, and then review bomb it. Even though there are these risks, I think in general, just getting Guild Wars 2 on Steam so that more regularly people see news about it, and it has the potential right at launch to maybe get on the bestsellers page, then that's going to be huge. That's going to be a ton of visibility. And supposedly, for what it's worth, you can predict Steam success by looking at the number of people who have it wishlisted before the game comes out and, like, times it by a certain number. But I'm not too familiar or obsessed enough with how that works to really dig deep. So I do want to ask a question here, and I've seen a few people ask it. I must admit it was on my mind. Uh, is this a step down for the studio, for Guild Wars 2, for ArenaNet? And what do I mean by that? Well, basically, does this look somewhat desperate? Like... Once this franchise was big enough to not have to give Valve a cut, once upon a time it was big enough to stand separate, but now it no longer is. Now we've, we have to make this move to, to keep going. And to a certain degree, anyone thinking that, I think, yeah, maybe there's some truth in that. But you also do have to consider that Guild Wars 2's biggest competitors in the West, namely Final Fantasy XIV, Elder Scrolls Online, are also both on Steam. Obviously, you do have World of Warcraft, but that's Blizzard associated and we're kind of under, under a totally different rule set when we deal with that. But FF14 and ESO, they both made the decision that this would be a good move, in some cases a long time ago now. So is it really a step down when what we're doing is making a move that puts us on par with two other games that in certain respects are just as successful, if not more successful, than Guild Wars 2 is in the most recent couple of years? So, really, I don't have any hang-ups about that. As for Valve's cut, again, do we in the community need to concern ourselves with that? But Valve will not be getting any money from microtransactions and stuff like that if it's not a Steam-associated account. So, obviously, none of the incumbent player base is going to affect anything. And I'm sure ArenaNet are going to keep encouraging people to pick up products through their own website. You know, when End of Dragons is getting closer, I'm sure that we'll have the opportunity to avoid Steam altogether. That's pretty much a given. I tend to feel that when it comes to matters of money, companies are pretty good at making sure that the moves they make are generally going to be profitable and good for the studio. Surely they've got this figured out. It's going to be a positive move, generally speaking. And, you know, I'll note as well, Guild Wars 1 obviously is a game, and Guild Wars 1 made the move to Steam a long time ago. So it's not even necessarily a new thing for ArenaNet. It's been on Steam for years now. I don't actually own it over there, funnily enough, because, again, the same thing. I already got it through ArenaNet stuff. I had nothing else to purchase. I think there's a thing where you can buy the base games from ArenaNet, but as long as you get the Eye of the North expansion on Steam, the whole thing will unlock over there or something? But, I mean, Guild Wars 1 has largely the exact same business model as Guild Wars 2. Slight less leniency on the microtransaction store, obviously. And it worked out over there. Again, as someone who hasn't really played Guild Wars 1 on Steam, I don't know whether there's any weird wriggles or annoying things. Looking at the first game on Steam might actually help us to guess at how the second one might be handled there too because obviously the platform if ArenaNet goes for it could allow them to do all kinds of things you know with the controller and in-house streaming and the workshop which obviously isn't going to be appearing and you know the forums and so on so how well will they go for it honestly I'm not very impressed with the page right now yeah it doesn't release until November but you can already navigate there information is available you can wishlist it for when it comes out but it seems pretty primitive so far. The recommended specs are really wonky. I think they were asking for like 24 gig of RAM. There's just a few screenshots. 
which, to be fair to them, do show fairly contemporary stuff. You know, like, there's some raiding screenshots there. Like, there's an image of Zera being fought. There's probably, like, a screenshot somewhere of World vs. World or looks, looks like a territory capture point. Uh, there's screenshots of some of the new Destiny's Edge characters. There's screenshots from Path of Fire. So there's a good smattering of things. Worst case scenario, the devs could have just been reusing all their vanilla assets, you know. Uh, but there's no trailer. And that seems really weird to me. A lot of the sections just haven't been filled out. Now, maybe the reason that there's not a trailer on the page yet is because actually, when it comes out in November, they're going to give us a proper Steam trailer. You know, that maybe has the Steam logo baked into it or something. That could be an opportunity for them to do something creative and something maybe to be excited about as a fan. But yeah, the page feels a bit barren. The reviews they chose are kind of, you know, as quotes for the main page are kind of lame. It's interesting seeing how they choose to describe the product because it's such a big product that caters to so many different people in so many different ways. How do you boil something like this down into just a couple of sentences? Uh, it's certainly not a skill I have and <laughs> to try it here on the Steam page. Another possibility when it comes out, by the way, that would be good for us as players is they might do bundles. Uh, so I would expect some kind of, you know, POF plus HOT plus the core game bundle that you're picking up. And in fact, if that is the only choice players have, it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever. But I'm thinking more in terms of Living World. Because, yeah, there is this side of Steam where anyone can post reviews. You really do want good reviews to be there. You want it to say positive or overwhelmingly positive if you can. And if people are hitting all these little paywalls and that does affect things, maybe ArenaNet can head that off. I do believe, and I have for a long time now, that the way they are packaging and selling Living World feels a bit out of date and feels a bit rough. As I mentioned a second ago, I tend to think in terms of finances, the studio must have thought really long and really hard about how they are selling parts of the product. And it's probably not worth us in the community giving any feedback there. They probably know the bottom line better than we do. But I do admit that I think they could be doing better with the way they package Living World. And maybe when it comes to Steam, that's an opportunity for them to really look at that and do something good. If there was a way to pick it up on Steam where it's just like the expansions or a bundle where it's all the expansions and all the Living World stuff, maybe separate seasons get bundled out, that, uh, that was year round, always there, that could be great then they're not going to want to make Steam the better place to buy. It would probably come over for everyone that uses their official website too. And that's just going to be good for all of us, right? I would think. I did take a second with this video today to read the Elder Scrolls Online and FF14 reviews, which are both being reviewed extremely well. But what's funny is if you do see a bad review, quite often it's people saying, don't buy the game on Steam. It sounds like it's a very bumpy progress, you know, because they're separate, but then they're going to be connected later. Uh, and they say, yeah, don't buy it here. Just go to the official website. That at least is happening with those two MMOs. I'm sure we'll have negative reviews as well that do a similar thing. Personally, the only way I will find myself buying Guild Wars 2 again, specifically to connect through Steam, and I can imagine a world in which I do this, it, because, you know, I like making new accounts. I like re-establishing and connecting with what new players are experiencing. It's actually one of my favorite things to do with this game. Uh, I will do it if they have Steam achievements. It'd be a cool reason to start fresh. See what those achievements are. I'm sure they'd just be boring copy-pastes of, like, going through the main storyline to a certain degree. But I'm a sucker for Steam achievements. And I kind of like the idea of picking them up for this franchise. I would say Guild Wars 1 doesn't have them so i don't know whether they'll do it for guild wars 2 i mean guild wars 1 got added to the platform at a very different time uh, maybe there wasn't even a possibility way back then so perhaps it's forgivable or maybe when it finally came to steam arena net shifted gears away now you know this is their main product and they're putting on steam maybe they'll find the time to do it it all depends just how hard they've thought about it. Uh, one little bit of scary news. <laughs> Amazingly, I got a tweet from Shaman this morning who was talking about how over on the Guild Wars 2 fan developer Discord, you know, for people who make third-party add-ons and tools in the community, things that integrate with the API, there's a Discord uh, that the devs sometimes post in, and it was pointed out there that because of the new connection thing, people over using Steam might not be able to access API stuff, and the devs hadn't thought of that yet, so now they might be scrambling to figure it out. I guess we'll see how it all goes. So there you go. That's really it. That's all I've got to talk about with the game coming to Steam. I think it's going to be a good move. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of new people to play with. And anything that will embolden Guild Wars 2's success is obviously good.
Let's move on. I want to talk now about the new Fractal. It was revealed on the anniversary stream. And, well, we've known about it for a while. Let's just remember that a couple of months ago, wasn't it? Uh, they did say we are working on a Fractal in one of their roadmaps. But they gave us no information beyond that. They simply said it was a mountain Fractal. And I feel like I did say I wanted it to be set in Canther. Well, with this new official trailer out that's pretty much confirmed we're going to Cantha, turns out that that is what the Fractal is doing too. So this is really interesting. When Path of Fire came out, we did end up getting a Fractal set in that area of the world, but the Fractal only released well into Path of Fire's lifespan. It was during episode one. In this situation, we're actually going to get a taste of the expansion region before the expansion itself comes out. So that's a pretty big thing if you guys are really anticipating getting back into the game just because you love this region of the world so much. Maybe you're a bit of an old gamer and you had a lot of fun and you got a lot of nostalgia for the original game. Well, you can get a taste as early as next month because we will be going to what they're calling the Sunkwa Peak. So Sunkwa Peak, that does confirm this is obviously based on the Guild Wars 1 explorable map uh, of the Sunkwa Vale. And that's what you've been looking at some of the Guild Wars 1 footage in the background for this video. It's me running around the Sunkwa Vale, uh, giving you guys a little taste of the various places we could go to. Now, I don't think it's really worth me going into really super detailed specifics here, because obviously the Guild Wars 2 content is going to be a fractal, which will change things up and will, can be very creative in its actual vision for what this area is like. I wouldn't expect some kind of one-for-one -one creation, recreation. I wouldn't expect it to be as close as, you know, standard living world stuff is, where in the real world we're returning to previous locations. Uh, the fractals change things up a ton. And in particular, the description of this fractal makes it sound quite chaotic and broken. So, yeah, I think the actual geography doesn't ma matter very much. But the Sunqua Vale is a mountain area that functioned as the very starting zone for new Canthan players. So it's very fitting, I think, that the Guild Wars 2 Fractal will be our very first starting experience of some Canthan architecture and so on. And yeah, it featured some rice paddies, a, a mountain area in the center where we first got to interact with Yeti and the Sensali. There was some Naga around. Any of these varieties of enemies would be so exciting. Oh man, I gotta do a video about cool enemies they could bring back in the new expansion. Anyway, more about the Fractal itself was revealed on the stream. It's releasing September 15th, and Cameron Rich came on to talk about it. He said that it's gonna be a fairly difficult Fractal. He actually had a whole speech that really seem to be talking to whiners on the internet, frankly, that feel like they don't get enough fractals, where he was saying, look, we really care about the fractal players, we really care about the dedicated fractal players, the ones who do it over and over and get really optimized and really good at it, and that this is supposed to be aimed at them. Now, I know we've heard uh, statements like that before, but to back it up, he says, this one has a challenge mode on release, now, that is only the third time we've ever seen that out of all the fractals. Uh, and in particular, from my memory, the challenge mode in the Nightmare Fractal, the first one they ever did, along with Bitterfrost Frontiers release, was probably one of my favorite all-time Guild Wars 2 patches. That was such an incredible patch to me, being able to play all of that living world and then go and really sink into the Fractal itself felt so good. And it was tuned really well for me back in those days. So this is a full-fledged challenge mode you guys know how cool they are, that they completely changed the experience. And beyond that, Cameron really said that this challenge mode was going to have something a little different this time. A new skill that people were going to have to pick up or focus on. Something that he was sure that if the really good players will eventually be able to blitz through and work with. But this is really a, a, a fractal, it seems, for those dedicated players. Uh, they say the, the general description is that it's a fractal where the goal is to climb a mountain against a ton of elemental enemies and what sounds like turbulence. The mountain itself is in turmoil and we're like trying to bring peace to it somehow. The original layout for the Fractal was actually designed a long time ago, back when they were doing the Ark storyline, which ended up being a trilogy of Fractals. They had an idea for this one, 
which was going to be a part of the story, but they ended up putting it aside and they just finished it up with the Shattered Observatory, which was the other challenge mode fractal. So they set this aside, but they liked it so much they said, look, we will come back to this prototype later. And now is later. They really are still excited about it. They've picked it back up. It's not going to be about the arc story. They've given it an overhaul, a complete facelift. They've reworked it and changed it for yeah, to include more contemporary mechanics and, you know, be a little bit more updated for the Path of Fire days. And we'll be getting it. It looks like it's going to be something to do with Cantha this time. But the core concept has been around for a while. Looking at the kind of things that they can do with the engine now, you know, look at some of the season four storyline where the terrain is building around you as you escape from the mists and stuff. I can imagine some really nuts things with this the configuration of the mountain itself actually tweaking as we climb it that I'm pretty excited to see. Uh, one other little note that I thought was interesting as he spoke on the stream, he said that the answer to, like the story answer to why this mountain is in turmoil is going to be surprising apparently. And uh, supposedly there's a lot of opportunity in this one to explore outside of the main path, find the history of the place. That sounds pretty in line with what a lot of the recent fractals have done, where there are these cubby holes and extra interactables and so on, which I'm sure will be good for a first playthrough. Supposedly there's going to be a full uh, preview of it coming up later, but in the meantime, they did share with us this concept art, I guess a very early layout of the fractal. I'll throw it on screen for you guys. Uh, in which you can see the general route through the environments. So we're beginning at the starting precipice, which I have to imagine will look visually similar to that cliff that looked over the Sunqua Vale in Guild Wars 1. Like right when you left the Xingji Monastery, your first look at the world beyond was a, like a kind of a precipice. I feel like they're going to do that. Then you've got the winding path up into the Elements Plateau. Obviously, this looks nothing now like the Guild Wars 1 map. Moving platforms, so a bit of jumping puzzly stuff. Periodic water pushes, the gauntlet of fire, the gro so you, definitely an elemental theme, and they did say that there's lots of elementals here. The grove of growth, the rising stone pillars, so yeah, you go water, fire, earth, I guess, grass and earth. And ending finally at the Jade Temple. Now that Jade Temple might draw visually inspiration from a place that wasn't even in the Sunqua Vale. That might be the temple in the heart of Zendaijun, actually, that the fractals kind of draw on there. And so maybe we'll, I mean, will we actually do something to do with the Guild Wars 1 story in Cantha? Because don't forget, fractals can draw at any point from history. So my ultimate hope here, particularly seeing a Jade Temple, is that this fractal doesn't really have anything to do with End of Dragons and the Deep Sea Dragon and all those amazing things. But it's just a little chance to nod back to the Guild Wars 1 story. Maybe we see Shiro here. Maybe we can actually fight some kind of version of him. You know, we could be a Revenant channeling Shiro fighting a version of Shiro in the mists. Or some kind of, you know, a Shuriken or whatnot. Maybe we get to see the effects of the Jade Wind somehow. I know that the Jade Wind never affected anything over on Shinji Island or near Shinji Monastery, but it's the Fractals. And look, this is a Jade Temple. They might be doing something there. So I'm uh, curious to see what they've got cooked up for us. And I'll have another video for you guys as soon as the full preview comes out. So there you go, those are two of the other big topics that I really want to give their own video. Uh, you guys can let me know what you think, particularly if I misspoke about the Steam side stuff, because it's kind of new to me, and uh, maybe some of you watching do know a lot more about how Steam operates, some of the benefits that maybe this game can get from going over there. All around, pretty exciting stuff. Thanks very much for watching, guys. And also, just so that you guys know, before I returned to YouTube with this big trailer yesterday, I have actually been working on videos and have finished the Elder Scrolls Arena playthrough. So Arena uploads will be continuing later tonight and will be going to the end of the game. So those who may have been watching a few months ago, please feel free to rejoin and uh, we will see how that concludes. The full thing is actually already on Patreon early for anyone who is feeling impatient or maybe wants to support me in some way after such a crappy year so far. But uh, I will see you guys for that very, very soon. Exciting stuff coming. Again, let me know your hopes for the fractals and whatnot. And thanks for watching.